This looks really different up here now with the seats like this, so. So good morning, I just want to say I'm, I'm always very uh, honored and, and thankful to have the opportunity to, to speak to, to y'all. Um, you know, I really feel like uh, we really have just a, a tremendous leadership here, and I'm not just saying that because I'm part of it, but, um, but you know, I, Kirk really is, a, you know, just a wonderful man of God, and I feel like his preaching has just hit another level, so I, I feel a little bit intimidated almost now. It's like, okay, hopefully I can can uh, hold the standard. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's so good to just spend time in the presence of God. And, you know, every time I have that opportunity, it just, it's so, just, just so stirring to have that sense of, wow, God is just so real. And as we're talking this morning about various things, you know, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, I just thinking, you know, you know, what Kirk was saying, you know, we just, we've got so much that we know about that we need to share with the world around us. And I think sometimes the biggest problem we have in, in life and in negotiating life is we forget what's real. You know, we lose vision and perspective of the real and we get caught up in stuff that really isn't real, stuff that isn't lasting, stuff that isn't, isn't permanently important. But when we see things with our spiritual eyes and we begin to align ourselves with the truth, we can experience God more fully in a way that we become just immersed in his goodness and satisfied with who he is. And we become more and more like him. So I want to talk this morning about the holiness of God. And my first point is that when we begin to grasp the reality of God's holiness, it's at the same time the most frightful and wonderful thing. It's like it's a really comforting truth, but it's also a very terrifying truth. You know, God cannot lie. He can't sin. He can't do anything against us that is negative because it's against his very nature. But yet, because he's holy, he also cannot overlook sin. He can't just make an exception in, in, in my case. My second point this morning is that we need to gain perspective as to why we sometimes love the unholy things, why we go after the unholy things. We need to really own the, the foolishness of our own lives when we, we expect any created thing to bring us the satisfaction and life that only the living God can bring. We need to see our choices when we make choices outside of God as things that are they're just bad trade-offs. We're trading the holy for the unholy, the, the unique for the common. We're trading the heavenly for the earthly, the truth for a lie. Because all things, all created things, apart from God, separated from God, they're lifeless, limited, they're local, and they're ultimately unprofitable. My third point this morning is that God is the one who works in us to make us holy. It's really kind of an amazing thing but the process of us becoming holy has very little to do with what we do. It has a lot to do with what God has done and how we just spend time with him and learn from him and see him and watch him and become like him. So let's dive into this. Revelation 4 verse 2 has this, this awesome scene in heaven. And it says, at once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and car carnelian. A rainbow resembling an em emerald encircled the throne. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. 
And they lay down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So, go to the next slide. I found this picture, which, you know, again, it's just a picture someone came up with. It's not, it's not a photograph or, you know, it's not handed down by God. Um, but, it, you know, just this scene is just so mind-blowingly awesome. So I just want to note a few things here. You know, first of all, this scripture talks about that God is holy, holy, holy. And it's interesting because, you know, in scripture, it tells us a lot about who God is. It says God is love. It says God is good. God is faithful. But it never, any other place, uses that word three times. When it talks about God's holiness, it's, he's holy, holy, holy. It's just so above and beyond all of his other attributes. It's a defining characteristic of who God is. Also note in the scripture how it couples the aspect of the fact that God is holy, holy, holy with his eternal nature. It says that God was and is and is to come. So God was holy, holy, holy. So for all time past... He was perfect in his holiness. So in your life, when you look back in your life, that means that God was always holy, holy, holy in all his dealings with us. So maybe, you know, I mean, I know bad things happen to most people, and some people experience just awful things, terrible things that should never happen. But they do. We have to realize God was holy, 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 in allowing those things to happen. We can't understand it sometimes, but, you know, God didn't do those things. And whatever he allows in our lives, we have to realize he will redeem those things and turn them into something good for you and for the people around you if you allow him. The second thing is God is holy, holy, holy. What does that mean to us today? It means God is with us right now. He is a present God He is not a God who stays far off away from us. He wants to be close to us every moment of every day. We can draw near to him in the now. And that's an awesome thing. And finally, God will be holy, holy, holy. It's like, why do we worry about the future? We can neither know or understand the future or change it, right? We have so little control you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We, we can't control it if it does. But God can do both. He knows what's going to happen, and he is orchestrating all circumstances for his purposes and his glory. So when you think about it, it's like, why do we worry? You know, God's the only one who really has the ability to deal, deal with it, so let's just let him do it. And finally, another part of this verse, it says that God created all things. They were made by him and for him. And he gave all things their being. So it's like only God is worthy of our worship. Only God is worthy of giving our lives to and dedicating our lives to because he's the only one that gives life to anything. It's like everything else is a created thing. It's a made thing. And yeah, they're good things because God made so many of these things and gave, gave us the ability to make things ourselves. But only God brings these things to being. So, first of all, there's there's incredible comfort in comprehending the holiness of God. Because God is holy and he cannot sin, he cannot by his nature be unfaithful or unloving or selfish or wrong to us in any way. You know, God will not treat you Wrongly, He won't single out somebody and say, well, you know, I really like Kirk because, you know, Kirk is just, he's just such a great guy and I like the way I made him more than, you know, the way I made Nathan. And I'm just picking them because they're on the opposite sides of the pew here. Um, But God just doesn't work like that. He will be completely fair in, in dealing with us. That also means he doesn't think the USA is more important than Iran or China. He loves all those people too. Second thing, because God can be trusted, we know that he is for us. It says that in Romans 8.31. 
It says he will never leave us or forsake us. He will complete the work that he, gives, that he begins in us. It says that in Philippians. He says, you know, the, the good work he began in you, he will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And he will lead us in his goodness. We sang that, that one song, your, your goodness is, is running after me. You know, it's like, it talks about that in Psalms, that he will lead us in the path of righteousness and his goodness will follow us all the days of our lives. Wow. So, you know, when we think about these things, like these are the character of God. This is who he is. This is what he has said he will do. He is both able to complete his word and faithful to do it. It's like there's no doubt on either end of it. It's not like he's not sure if he's going to do it and is not sure if he's able to do it. He can do both. Now, the flip side of that, there's also the absolute fear when we comprehend the holiness of God. So first of all, he can't overlook or pretend that sin is okay. You know, we don't have forgiveness of sin because God overlooks it. We have forgiveness of sin because Jesus paid for it on the cross. God himself took our sin upon him and made that payment. So there was a righteous transaction that took place that had nothing to do with just saying, eh, it's okay, I'll just forget it this time. It's like, no, payment was made. Now, when we stand in Christ, that's credited to our account which is completely unfair, you know, that we get the righteousness of Christ for our sin in exchange. But God did it in a way that completely satisfies his righteousness. Nahum 1.3 says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. The second thing, and I mentioned this already, he will judge each person objectively. There's no favorites being played. Psalms 98.8 says, The rivers clap their hands, let the mountains Sing together for joy and let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. And finally, God will eliminate one day all sin from his presence. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So, you know, again, this is really fast and I'm really condensed. But we got to recognize that God is who he is. He is a holy God. He's a good God. But he's also perfect and righteous in his, in his holiness. And really, when we start to comprehend God's holiness, we cannot help but live differently. Because it affects everything when we come into that place of realizing, wow, God is so good and so perfect. And like Kirk talked about, you know, God didn't just save us for our sake. He also saved us because he wants everyone to understand the goodness of who he is. But yet, so often, we choose the unholy things in our lives. Why do we do this? Well, let's look at an example from, from history. Um, look at it in, in Exodus 32. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain. So this is the children of Israel, and they've been led out of Egypt, and they're, they're taken to Mount Sinai, and uh, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the, uh, the law from God. And so we have this scene of the people that are left behind on the, on the base of the mountain. It says, when, Moses, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountains, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come make us gods who will go before us. Now remember, it was like 40 days. It wasn't like, you know, three years or something. Come and make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. He went up on the mountain, he disappeared. He's probably never coming back. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took what they handed him and made, made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now, I love Aaron. He really fought hard to resist this, didn't he? Just, you know, all right, here we go. So when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the, the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. 
So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. And afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry, which in some versions says they got up to play. So, so how many of us have ever fashioned a god out of some material and made offerings to it or bowed down and prayed to it? Probably nobody in here, right? I mean, when we read accounts like this, we think it's ridiculous. We think, how in the world would these people be so foolish? But, you know, let's try to ask ourselves, why did they do this? First of all, they were afraid that Moses wasn't coming back. You know, they had just seen all these amazing things that God did through Moses, you know, the, the plagues on Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, you know, the, the, the uh, armies of, it, of Egypt being drowned in the Red Sea behind them. Just amazing things. Now, where's Moses? Well, if Moses is gone, that means, you know, okay, God's gone. So we got to come up with some, something here. They were worried about their future. Who's going to lead us? Now, I don't know why, again, you know, a, a, a fashioned idol out of a material which has no ability to do anything is going to lead them. You know, that, that's, that's hard to understand, but that's kind of where their minds were. And it also sounds like they were bored, right? They've been sitting around for 40 days waiting. They didn't, you know, they wanted to do something. So they wanted a good excuse to get up and play. Now, so put that aside. How many of us in this day and age have neglected God and put in his place some desire, some ambition, some person, some pursuit, something, anything ahead of having Christ at the center of your life? I know I have. <laughs> we probably all have, right? At some point, in some way, we put things in front of God. Every time we choose to put a created thing ahead of the creator, and when I say that, I'm not just talking things. It could be a person. People were created. It could be, you know, a, a pursuit, something you really like to do, which, which is, again, is really a created thing. Anytime we put those things in front of God, we're being as silly as those Israelites we scoff at. What is silly also is to remember that everything that we put in front of God was given its goodness by God. There's nothing good apart from what God has created and what God has done. So things that are good, that we love, that we maybe go after in front of God, are just things that have their goodness because of God. He's the source of everything good. Remember in Revelation 4, it says, For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So, you know, the being, the essence of everything good came from God. And in a way, when we love things of the world or things that are created, we should realize that love is just, just channeling to God. He's the ultimate source of it. Now, made things, they're different from a true God in the fact that they're lifeless. Created things only have the life in them that's granted by God. They're limited, right? Created things are, are finite. They can only do so much. They only have so much power, so much energy. They're local. They're, they're in one place at one time. Um, you know, it's like, I love my wife. She's awesome. She's an amazing wife. But she can only be at one place at one time. You know, when I'm at work, and yeah, she could drive there if I needed her there, but she can't be there right that second. You know, when I'm, uh, you know, wanting something, you know, wanting to figure out an engineering problem, I can't go to her, all right? That she has no, no resources to help me with that. Um, you know, there's just a lot of times when we think about people and we put a lot of pressure on them because we want people to fill our, those roles in our lives that only God can fill. Because people are limited. They're local. And ultimately, in, them, in and of themselves, all created things are unprofitable. Pleasures fade. People die. Careers end. Stuff falls apart. It's so cheery, isn't it? <laughs> but that's what idolatry is. You're exchanging the real for the, for, for the fake, the, the, the permanent for the temporary. It's trading the holy for the unholy, the truth for a lie. Romans one twenty four sums this up. It says, Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. 
They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. So, and good job if you guys are keeping up with me. I know I'm going fast here. Um, so created things are always limited. They can't see everything. They can't hear everything. They can't be everything we need. They're unable to be where you need them, when you need them, and do what you need them to do. Now compare this to our God. It says in Isaiah 50, verse 2, Was my arm too short to ransom you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? I love that. So wherever you are in your life right now, whatever your problem is, God is telling you, my arm is not too short. My strength is not too small. My ability to to minister to your situation is not lacking. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is what we all truly are longing for, right? We want life. We define it all kinds of different ways. There's all kinds of different things we do to get life. But that's what we really want, right? We want life. We want to be alive. We want to enjoy life. And that's only something that God creates and gives, which is why he alone is worthy of our worship. So why do we worship idols? Why do we go after per- created things? Why do we pursue things that in the, in the end can't really give us the life we look for? And the bottom line is because we have needs that we think God can't fill. I mean, let's, let's be honest. It's like there's things that we think, I have this need, but God can't fill this need, so I'm going to fill it over here some other way. God's ways can be hard. So hard, sometimes we just want to take a shortcut. You know, that's what the, the, you know, the, the original sin in, in the garden, right? It was, hey, you can become like God. Eat this fruit. You know, just one easy step. <laughs> Didn't work out so well. Get an example. I feel like our society, you know, sex is one of the, the biggest idols in our, in our culture. We can choose to worship sexual pleasure, but then that which is called good by God becomes a meaningless act, which eventually leaves the person unsatisfied, even as they pursue more and more to satisfy that lust. Because again, idols have no life in them. They've got no, no life to give. So let's look at uh, another scriptural example here. Here's another way the Bible describes idols. It's in Jeremiah 2, verse 13. It says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So a cistern's a means of of capturing rainwater. So, you know, the rain, it's a good thing God created, provided by God. Capturing it, you know, obviously makes sense because you need to be able to to have that water later when it's not raining. But this is saying that when we worship anything outside of God, it's a broken cistern. It can't hold water. So the idea of trying to capture water is a good thing. But we're trying to control it for ourselves. And that's what we're doing with idols. We're saying, okay, this is a good thing. I want to use that thing at my control, at my discretion when I need it, so that I'm in control. And ultimately, that's what idol worship is all about. It's really about self-worship. It's about, I want to be God. You know, going back again to the Garden of Eden, that's how it all started. I want to be in control. I want to be the one who decides what's right and wrong. I want to control my circumstances. And control is always such a hard thing, because we want to be able to manage everything so that it's, you know, comfortable, it's not shocking, it's not surprising, God says, you know what? You don't have the capacity. You're a broken cistern. You can't control everything because you're just a limited human being. Now, these things that we try to control, they may deliver some comfort. They may give us some amount of satisfaction and pleasure. But again, that that goes back to because God created it in the first place. But we're unable to hold on to that. And these things by themselves just become empty. Going back to the example of sex outside of marriage, of committed marriage, 
It's a broken cistern because it tries to capture that which God created as good and turn it into something else. It destroys the goodness of what God created. So God created sex for intimacy, for, for, for making children, for bonding people together, and, and pleasure. Yes, even that. Um, God created these things, and he says, okay, this is a great thing, you know, and I'm going to put it in this confines of marriage because then it will be, it will be properly managed and contained and used for the, the purposes that I intend. If you take that outside, which the world has done, what does it become? It becomes a mess. In the process, it becomes an empty thing. It becomes a, a thing that causes hurt and, and pain all over the place. To do that, you have to reject God because you know, okay, I'm going against God's ways, so I'm going to reject God and his ways, and I'm going to break his commands. I'm going to cut myself off from the living well. And all that water that can only come from God to satisfy us gets cut off. So again, all of our choices, you know, we just have to get used to thinking about this. You know, what am I choosing here? Am I choosing God or am I choosing an idol? 1 Samuel 2.2 2 says, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. 1 Kings 18.21 says, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And I love that because it's just that simple. You know, we have to get this mindset. Is this thing I want to do outside of God's will, is that really God? Because if it is, then go for it. 100%. If it's not, then do what's right and go for God. You know, we just got to get our minds clear on these things. You know, don't stumble into sin. Don't allow yourself to sin. Say, I'm choosing sin because I think that's God. Be honest with yourselves. 1 Samuel 12, 20 says, Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. So, again, just make that, make that clear thought in your mind. You know, what is the idol that you're worshiping when you start to go, go apart from God's ways? What are you trying to control? What need are you trying to meet in your life? And then ask yourself, how would God meet this need that I have? Might he be able to meet this need better than the way I'm trying to do it? And how can I find what, what it is that God wants to give me? So how do we learn to walk with God and experience his goodness and holiness? So my third point this morning, again, is that God works in us to make us holy. And it's this process of... We see him. We become like him as we spend time with him and obey him and, and follow him. You know, and it's not a work of the flesh. So when I was um, 15, 16 years old, I was, uh, you know, I was in youth group. And actually, my older brother was, uh, was the youth leader. And, and I, got, I got, you know, inspired to really get serious about my faith. And so I, I wanted to be a good Christian. I wanted to do everything right. I started to study my Bible, and I started to try and pay attention to the way I was living. Now, my efforts, efforts eventually just led to frustration because I didn't really understand the gospel at that point in my life. You know, I really thought I had to earn God's favor. So that was a big part of my motivation was, hey, i got to do good do right so that God accepts me. I also didn't understand that it was his work in me, not my work to please him. So after a couple years of this, I was like, you know what? This is too hard, and it's no fun, and I can't do it. And so I turned away from, from God. Kind of funny, though, you know, because being a good, you know, church-going kid, I was still in church every Sunday, but, you know, I checked out. And for a few years, I just ignored the things of God in my life. And they eventually started to call me back. And then he showed me, hey, you know that, that 
the thing about Jesus dying on the cross, that's, that's what's important here. And, you know, he took that burden of sin that you can never carry so that all you have to do is, is put yourself in Christ. Now you're acceptable to him. And I was like, oh, that, that, that's how this works? Okay. I didn't realize that. I mean, somehow, I don't know. You know, I grew up in a Christian home for 22 years. I didn't understand that it was what Jesus had done, not what I do, that, that made me holy. And then I started to realize, okay, it's not my strength that made me acceptable to God. It's not my strength that will make me holy in the end. It's walking with God. So it's not a work of the flesh. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Galatians 3, 2 says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Paul's saying this to the Galatians. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? So, according to these verses, our part in growing and becoming holy is remaining in the vine, believing God's word. And I believe believing is an active thing. It's not just, you know, a mental thing. It's, you know, okay, God is, is commanding me to do these things. I believe that that's true. I'm going to do them. So, it's a following and, and, and learning to follow after God. But in essence, I think it's more of a responsive action than it is a, I'm going to do this action. You know, it's like learning to be led by God and to just, just see what he's doing and follow after him. You know, Jesus even talked about this in his own life. He said, I just do what I see the Father doing, which is crazy, right? I mean, here's Jesus. He's equally God with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he says, when he's on earth, all he's doing is what the Father tells him to do. All he's doing is seeing what, what God wants him to do and doing it. So why do we think it should be any different for us, right? So seeing is becoming. Earlier I mentioned that we become like those things we pursue. And this is both true when we pursue lifeless things as well as the living God. So in Psalm 115, verse 3, it says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. So this is kind of a scary thought. But when we choose to pursue things other than God, we become like that thing we pursue. And you think about it, when you talk to people, you can tell what's really important to them because that's what they talk about. That's what's important to them, you know? Um, I'll admit, I, I am a Ohio State Buckeye fan, okay? At least in football season. You know, the rest of the sports I don't care about. But, um, you know, at this time of year, you'll find me talking about them a lot because I'm watching them. I'm paying attention to them. So anything we, in this world, in this life, we've got to recognize the more time you spend with it, the more you're like, like that you're becoming. Now, the flip side is also true. 1 John 3.1 says this, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is, is pure. So I'm going to wrap up with this point, that a key aspect of us becoming like Jesus is seeing him. Now, I know this verse specifically is talking about seeing him when he's revealed, when he returns again, you know, we see him with our physical eyes or our, our, our new eyes that were, ma were made uh, after the resurrection. But I think there's a key aspect of this that 
our striving for God and for purity is not j- just a work of the flesh. But as we fix our gaze upon Jesus, as we think about the things of Jesus, as we spend time in his word, as we spend time in worship, as we spend time doing the things that he calls us to do, we become more and more like him. And this ultimate hope of being made pure and being made in his image gives us that motivation now. It says that everyone who has this hope purifies himself because it's like, wow, you know, that's what's ahead. You know, this forever, forever thing that we talked about this morning. It's like, that's what's going to last forever is us being in heavenly places with spiritual bodies, with the Lord physically visible to us. That's, that's the forever thing. And one day, we're going to get to experience all of that. And I think it's so much more than, you know, just an eternal church service. I think some people, you know, think that, oh, this, you know, it's just like a, you know, worship service that goes on for eternity. I mean, I think that's part of it. But I think there's so much more of that than we can even imagine. You know, it talks about having responsibilities and, you know, all kinds of things in heaven. I believe it's going to be so much more awesome than anything we can possibly imagine. Because how could it not be? Right? If this life here is as good as it is, even though it's rough sometimes, how can heaven not be like, you know, a million times even more? So we have that hope that motivates us now. We say, wow, I want to be like Jesus as much as I can even now. Second Corinthians 3.16 says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, this is kind of the context of talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So, in the Old Covenant, they didn't know Jesus. They just were following the law. Now, when they may turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, we're reflecting God to the world as we're being transformed into his likeness. So this word transformed, it's, a, it's an interesting word. It's the Greek word metamorpho, which uh, uh, we think of, you know, metamorphosis, like a caterpillar turning from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that kind of thing. It's used in two other places in Scripture. The first is where Jesus is uh, transfigured before three of his, his disciples. Um, so you can go back uh, another one there. Yeah, so we see the kind of a, you know, another artist rendition of uh, the transfiguration. But here's Jesus, you know, and he's normally just looks like a man. You know, he's just walking and talking like men around and he goes up on the mountain with uh, James and Peter and John. And all of a sudden, he lets his humanity drop off for a second. Right? So his, this is ongoing miracle that God became flesh. That he veiled himself in flesh. Which is, you know, cre- crazy. Right? How does that happen? I don't know. That's why Christmas is so amazing. You know? God became a baby. He became a man. And then for a moment... He said, you know what, I'm going to temporarily stop this miracle of me being in flesh and let them see just a glimpse of what I am, you know, normally. And they're like, bah! (laughs) Um, So, you know, this glory was revealed. Now, that glory wasn't something he didn't have. That was glory that was always there. But it was veiled by flesh through this, this miracle of the Incarnation. So, in a way, our, trans- or our transformation is similar, but it's different, right? Because, I mean, we have unholy flesh, and we have sinful ways that mar the, the beauty of what God is doing in us in many, many ways. But yet, in, this, in the other sense, it's exactly the same, because God's Spirit is in us. If you are a follower of Christ, He put His Spirit in you. He's changing you from one degree of glory to another, so that that true nature of glory inside of you is being revealed to the world. And that's the transformation that God wants. He wants to take that thing that he's put in us, and as we walk with him, and we learn from him, and we see him, it becomes more and more revealed to the world that, hey, God is real. I see him in Nolan. I see him in Christopher. I see him in Nathan. 
That's what God wants to do. He wants to make us his reflection in this world. Two words that jump out to me in this passage in, in 2 Corinthians. Let me go back to 2 Corinthians 1 again, please. Um, it talks about the spirit and freedom. So when we turn to Jesus, he sets us free from sin. He puts a spirit into us, and now we walk in that freedom to become more and more like him. It's like now that we're set free, we can see with spiritual eyes. When we read his scripture or we listen to it in our ears, he brings understanding through his spirit. That changes us. As we walk in life and we see him doing things and we follow after him, we become released. We become free to do what God asks us to do, to become more like him, to reflect God, and again, to become in the likeness of God. I mean, this is, this is amazing. That us people, us basic, simple, sinful creatures can be made more and more in the image and likeness of the holy, holy, holy God. The second place this word transformed is used, which we already gave you a preview of, is in Romans 12, um, which says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, which also brings to mind Ephesians 5.25, which says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. So, you know, our part in this transformation, you know, renewing of our minds, being in God's word. Um, but again, it's not just, just studying the Bible for the sake of studying the Bible. It's about taking these things to heart. It's about becoming like him by following him, obeying him, knowing him. And ultimately, this is the great thing, is as we immerse ourselves in God and we follow after his ways, you will never be more satisfied. There's nothing better than being in that place where you're in God's God's will, when you're doing his will, you're, you're being satisfied by who he is to a greater level than anything in this world could ever do on its own. Because again, all those good things that we like to do, you know, watching Ohio State football or, or playing golf or, or, you know, being successful in a business, you know, all these things are things that God allows us to do from his goodness. But when we put him in the center of all those things, then those things are just wonderfully satisfying. Because it's getting its goodness from God. And we put him in his place and we worship him in everything we do. Man, it's just so satisfying. Everything becomes right. The ultimate picture is us becoming like him by seeing him, knowing him, following him. And trusting God completely to fulfill every need we have. So... Return back to my, my earlier story, you know, when I was a young man and I turned away from God, he, he eventually led me back. And it's, you know, been a long journey, you know, that I've been on, and I still haven't arrived, you know. You would have thought I would have figured it out by now. Right, Kirk? I mean, come on, how long does it take? Um, but yet God is continually working in my life. He's continuing to fulfill that promise that I will complete the work I began in you. He's continually showed me, I will not leave you or forsake you. He's continually proved himself faithful. He continually proves himself good. And more and more, it's like, wow, you know what? And I said it up here before a few weeks ago. Someone wants to come and take this body? Go ahead. You know what? There's something better waiting. You know? We kind of just strip away the thought that, that this life is all that matters because it just isn't. So again, as I learned that I'm accepted by God because of Christ and because of his sacrifice was 100% complete. There was nothing I could add to it or, or take away from it. And then as I just rest in Jesus and walk with Jesus... He works in me to make me want to do good things, to become holy because of I'm just reflecting who he is. 
you know, that change sometimes over a lifetime is imperceptible. You know, you might look back and say, geez, I'm the same as I was last year, it seems. But you look back longer sometimes, you say, wow, this is undisputable. I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. I'm not the same person I was 30 years ago. God is so very good. He is so faithful. He is so wonderful in all of his attributes. And he's holy, holy, holy. He's far and above anything we can think or imagine. Yet he has come to us in a way that we can can know him, look at him, follow him, and become more and more like him. Let's do that. Jesus, I just thank you that you are just so wonderful, God. You're just so just so amazing. I mean, I just think about all the things about you that, uh, um, you know, the, the world would never write the script that you've written. God, even as we, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about Thanksgiving this week, Lord, there's so much to be thankful for because every good and perfect gift comes from you. And, and Lord, as we think about Christmas coming and how you became human flesh, and dwelt among us that we would see a picture of who you are, that you could talk to your people, and and those things could be written down and and given to us so we could know more about you. And God, you sent your Holy Spirit so that we can actually have you inside of us to feel you, to to hear your voice. Lord, it's uh, just just awesome. It's It's just amazing. It's hard to, hard to comprehend, but God, it's so great, and we're just so thankful. Lord, I pray that our eyes would just be open to, to look more deeply at you, that we would become more and more like you, and that the world might see that reflected glory, that who you are would be reflected through us to this world that so desperately needs hope, that so desperately needs goodness. We just pray you'd birth these things in us, God, new and strengthen them. Help us to, to walk closer to you this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.